Hey, life science, we're going to keep studying the chordates. And remember, we've gone into the vertebrates, which are animals that not only have a central nerve cord, but they also have a backbone as well as an endoskeleton. So all of the animals that we're talking about from now on have bones, and they have bones similar to the ones that we have that we talked about today. Well, before. Hey, life science, we're still talking about chordates, although we've moved now into vertebrates, which remember are animals that have not just a dorsal nerve cord, but also an endoskeleton with a backbone. That's right, all of the animals that we're talking about from now on have endoskeletons with bones similar to the ones that we have that we talked about. We're gonna start with the least similar to us and then start getting more and more similar to humans. So starting with classes of vertebrates, we're going to start way out in the jawless fish, which are class Agnatha. So jawless fish live in both marine and freshwater environments, and they are um, sometimes anadromous, which means that they have a life cycle in which they are hatched in freshwater, then they migrate to saltwater as adults, and then go back to freshwater in order to reproduce. One example of a jawless fish is the lamprey eel. When their eggs hatch, they're in a larval form called amicetes, which behave and look different from their adult form. They feed by producing strains of mucus that trap food particles in the water. So that's, that's great. They catch food with sticky mucus in water. And then they live as larvae for as many as seven years until they metamorphose. When they are adults, that is a, that's a nightmare picture right there. When they are adults, they have round, sucker-like, jawless mouths, and they are filled with these like horn-like teeth and a raspy tongue. So they, um, they basically have like one octopus sucker for a mouth, but it's like filled with sharp things. And it's supported by a ring of cartilage instead of a jaw. So they are parasitic in that they attach to prey by their mouth, that awful nightmare of a mouth, and they have this pumping mechanism. So they kind of like stay stuck to the mouth as if with uh, like it's a suction cup. And then using its tongue and its teeth, it scrapes the skin off of its prey and just sucks its blood. Whew. Whew. Anyway, I think I would not recommend those as a pet. Um, they have a cartilage skeleton, so not quite bone in like what we have. They are still cartilage, though it's still endoskeletal, if you want to consider that a skeleton. Its skull is made of overlapping plates of cartilage that encase and protect the, the brain, and it has large optic lobes. Remember that the lobes of a vertebrate's brain tend to reflect what is important to that particular vertebrate. So large optic lobes means that this lamprey eel depends on sight. Here's another class of fish. It's chondrichthys, which are cartilaginous, cartil cartilaginous fish. They have cartilage in them. Man, they, they really uh, don't go easy on you with the words here. So uh, class chondrichthys. Um, have very elaborate endoskeletons that include a jaw. So these fish have jaws, not bones. They are cartilage for their skeleton. The flexible cartilage skeleton is not reinforced with calcium, so that's what keeps it flexible, and it includes sharks, rays, and skates. So a shark has very recognizable swimming fins, and uh, if you want to name them all, we've got pectoral fins, which are near the head. Those are the ones on the bottom of the shark that almost resemble its arms. It has a caudal fin, which is at the end of its tail. There is an anterior dorsal fin. Remember, anterior would be on the side opposite the mouth, and dorsal would be on the back, so that would be its rear top fin. The post, I'm sorry, anterior is the mouth. Got that backwards. The anterior is the mouth side. That, that's worth starting over. No, it's not. It's just worth editing it. Okay. All right. 
sharks have very recognizable fins. Um, first, there are the pectoral fins, uh, which are the two near the head on the underside. They would kind of be like what we would imagine the shark's arms to be. The caudal fin is at the end of the tail. That was the one on the underside of the tail. It almost looks like a rudder. The anterior dorsal fin would be the, uh, the famous one that sticks out of the water when it's coming to get you. Um, anterior being on the mouth and head side and dorsal being on its back. So that's the one on the front, on the back. The posterior dorsal fin, that would of course be the one behind that, posterior being on the side opposite the mouth. So it's the rear top fin. The anal fin and the pelvic fin are both on the underside. The anal fin is further back toward the posterior side, and the uh, pelvic fin is um, further forward, although still quite posterior to the shark. Okay, so those are the fins of, each, of a shark. Hopefully, you don't get a very good close look at them because, you know, then you're close to a shark. Um, the mouth of a shark is another part of a shark you don't want to get close to. It's typically lined with rows of razor sharp teeth. These teeth are calcified and strong enough to bite through skin, flesh, and bones. You know, the stuff that you're made of. Lost teeth are replaced from a row further back so it can regenerate its teeth. And if I'm not mistaken, I think I see a tooth missing in the jaw of the... Uh, picture of the shark um, here on this slide. See if you notice it. Maybe I'm making it up. So sharks have gills, which of course they do because they're fish. They breathe through gills that are rich with capillaries. It needs to have capillaries in its gills so that it can exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide with the water, or I should say between the water and its blood. Water passes over gills as it swims. And sharks have an independent means of pumping water through their gills. So it's not actually necessary for sharks to continue to swim in order for them to breathe, which is apparently a, a common misconception that people have about sharks. Sharks' senses are um, actually quite incredible. They have a sense of smell, which is better than their eyesight, um, but they have something else, which is really unique. They have something called a lateral line which is a canal that runs the length of their body. They're full of receptors that detect very small vibrations, but even more incredible, they're extremely sensitive to weak electrical fields produced by prey. And they can locate prey without any visual or scent cues, just by like sensing the electricity in their muscles. Now, I've included a picture of a hammerhead shark here because hammerhead sharks, let's just admit it, they look ugly. They look really, really crazy, and it just makes no sense why they would look like that unless it actually serves as a kind of antenna for this electrical sen sense that they have. And in fact, that is what their bizarre head shape does. It amplifies their ability to detect electrical fields in their prey. Okay, how do sharks reproduce? Well, they reproduce by internal fertilization, meaning that the eggs are fertilized and develop in the mother, and they have a viparous development, which means that the eggs um, are going to be laid outside of the mother's body, and the eggs, okay, I, I got that wrong. So let's talk about sharks reproduction. They have internal fertilization, which means that the eggs are fertilized inside of the mother's body, but then they have a viparous development, which means that the eggs develop after they are out of the mother's body. So um, the male is going to transfer um, sperm to the female with something called a clasper, which is attached to its pelvic fin. And then the fertilized egg is released in a capsule, which attaches to stationary objects underwater. Uh, there's a picture of one that you can see. You can see the little baby shark inside. Oh, isn't it so cute until it kills you? And um, some sharks are actually uh, viviparous, which means that they give birth to live young rather than laying them in an egg capsule. So sharks have an interesting symbiosis with a species of fish called a remora. Um, remora attach to shark with a sucker organ on their head, kind of like the lamprey eel, but they're not parasites. They actually eat scraps from whatever the shark is eating. So they're hitching a ride on the shark, and then they kind of you know, eat the crumbs from under its table, so to speak. 
Remora also eat parasites off the shark's scales. So they're quite the opposite of a parasite. This is actually a mutual um, relationship for them. So besides sharks, rays, and skates are also cartilaginous fish. Um, they are flat and thin, um, like pancakes. Just felt the need to throw that in there. Um, rays have slender whip-like tails, but skates have thicker fleshy tails. That's how you can tell a ray from a skate. Um, rays and skates reproduce either um, by an oviviparous or viviparous means. Um, rays can be either one. Those skates are oviparous. So skates will lay eggs. Rays can lay eggs, but sometimes um, their uh, young, I'm sorry, rays don't lay eggs. Their eggs hatch inside of them so uh, that they are oviviparous or they give birth to live young, which would be viviparous. And here are some totally adorable pictures of baby rays and skates. Aren't they so cute? Yes, they are, was the answer to that question. So rays and skates are often called birds of the sea, um, except for tuna, that is the chicken of the sea. The pectoral fins of rays and skates propel them through the water like wings, and the tail directs them as they swim. Uh, their body design is well adapted to lie at the bottom of the ocean so that their eyes can be on the top and they can look for danger. They have blunt teeth, ideal for crushing, rather than sharp teeth, ideal for slicing. And for their defense, some of them can change color to blend in. And of course, they also have sharp spines on their tails. Okay, finally, we're done with the jawless and the cartilage fish. We finally have fish with bones, class Osteichthys. Now just to break down that name for a second, the os part refers to bones, and the ichthyus part refers to fish. If you ever see any other words that contain those roots, you'll know that that means bony fish. Okay, so class Osteichthys have partially calcified skeletons. Their bones are not quite as sturdy as uh, the bones of amphibians and reptiles and mammals. They have a pectoral and pelvic girdle, girdle, girdle. They have pectoral and pelvic girdles made of cartilage. And they have the same basic fin types as a shark, as well as a lateral line, but this is for detecting predators, not prey. As far as breathing goes, um, class Osteichthys, the bony fish will open mouth to draw their to draw water in, and then they'll close their mouth and open what's called an opercula, which covers their gills. This way, water flows past the gills and out through the opercula. It's kind of like their their breathing vent system through their mouth. So um, they have proportionally large dorsal fins for stabilization, although some of them have sharp spines for defense. And if you've ever um, caught a bluegill, you already know about that. Um, their body is covered in overlapping scales, which are covered in mucus. Now, the mucus waterproofs the scales and protects the fish from parasites, as well as makes the fish hydrodynamic. By being covered in a kind of mucus that water won't stick to, it means that water won't stick to the fish and they're able to glide through it more easily. As far as feeding and digestion for bony fish, the food travels through their mouth across their tongue that's lined with taste buds, which means fish actually have a sense of taste. Which means, again, if you've ever smelled fish food, you know that it is a terrible sense of taste. Food passes through their muscular pharynx, remember that's the region inside the mouth, and into the esophagus, which leads to the stomach. So far, it's the same digestive tract that you have. Here, food is broken down and stored in the stomach until it needs to be digested when it's sent to the intestine. Um, the pyloric cica secretes digestive enzymes into the intestine and stomach chemicals. So we've got a very similar digestive tract to what we have. They also have a liver, which you also have. This is an organ that secretes bile a mixture of salts and phospholipids that aids in the breakdown of fat. Without bile, neither fish nor you could digest fat. It's concentrated in the gallbladder, and this is a very important part of digestion, even for humans, but here we have it in fish. 
Um, the liver stores excess glucose as a polysaccharide called glycogen, which is just an energy storage, and it can convert nutrients from one form to another. Liver also cleans blood by removing dead blood cells, bacteria, and debris, and it filters toxic byproducts, including um, various kinds of things that would be given off by um, food that it eats. Um, sometimes the food that uh, we eat, the digestion releases part of the food that actually was uh, not quite so good for us. The liver is what cleans it out of our blood. Ammonia, for example, is a byproduct of digesting protein. Ammonia is poisonous, so when you digest protein, which is necessary for your life, but it produces a poison, what do you do? Your liver converts it to urea, and then kidneys will filter that out of your blood, and that is dispelled through urine. In fact, the name urine and the name urea are related to each other for that reason. Okay, so what other body systems do bony fish have? They have an air bladder, which they use to manage their buoyancy with gases from their blood and digestive system, as well as a nervous system, which of course they do, their vertebrates, which give them a heightened sense of smell and sight, as well as, um, well, the, the sense from their lateral line, of course. Um, for fish, eyesight is less important at great depth due to lack of light. Light doesn't go through water quite the same way it goes through air, so eyesight is different for fish than it is for land animals. Okay, how about reproduction? So most bony fish are oviparous, uh, which means, of course, that they lay eggs which develop until they hatch. When females lay eggs, that's called spawning, and then um, the males will cover those laid eggs with milt, which um, is just how they deposit their sperm, which means that this is external fertilization. Fish have a two-chambered heart. This is the closest that we've come to a heart in the style that we have. Otherwise, we've just had musculature surrounding blood vessels that kind of squeeze blood through almost like you squeeze toothpaste through a tube. Now this is actually a central pump and it has two chambers. It's an atrium and a ventricle. The atrium is a chamber that receives blood from a vein and a ventricle is a chamber from which blood is pumped out through an artery. Um, and we have atria and ventricles as well in our heart, though we'll get to that when we do uh, mammals. So in the circulatory system, blood is going to leave the heart through an ventral aorta, and the aorta is the name of the largest artery. This ventral aorta branches into different brachial arteries. These arteries supply capillaries in the gills. The blood leaves the gills through an efferent brachial artery, and then these dump blood into the dorsal aorta. What, all that to say, the heart sends blood to the gills to get oxygen and then takes it back. That's how um, oxygen is exchanged with the water. The heart sends blood to the gills and then takes it back. Okay, so since um, some of the blood uh, goes to the brain, you've got other um, uh, cells in the head that receive that blood that's carried back to the heart by the anterior cardial vein, and then um, other blood is going to supply the rest of the body, absorbs nutrients from the intestines, is filtered of waste materials by the kidneys, and then it's carried back to the heart by the posterior cardial vein. So the heart is going to have to supply um, blood both directions in the fish. Class osteichthyes is ectothermic, which is a term that means cold-blooded. In other words, they can't regulate their own body heat you are not ectothermic because your body temperature is very carefully controlled. In fact, if your body temperature goes off by more than a degree, you get very sick. Um, it's not like that with fish. Their body temperature is just whatever the water is. So a couple examples of bony fish. We've got carp. Just make sure that you uh, spell that carefully. Um, they are freshwater fish that feed at the bottom of water. They, are, um, they eat a varied diet and they can be brightly colored. And if you have a pretty carp, it's usually called a koi, and you might keep them in a koi pond. Salmon is another example of a bony fish. They live their adult life in the cold waters of the Atlantic Ocean, 
but in late spring or early summer, they travel back to the fresh cold water stream in which it was born to reproduce. So when salmon reproduce, the spawning females can lay as many as 20,000 eggs. And then of course, the males fertilize them and then they head back to salt water. The hatched young are gonna stay in the fresh water for a few years and then head to the ocean. Okay, um, betta fish. They live in the warm fresh waters of Southeast Asia. Maybe you have one at home. They're cultivated as aquarium fish because they're just so pretty. Um, territorial males, though, they earn the name Siamese fighting fish. That is a name by which you might find them in a pet store. And it's pretty much recommended um, only keep one male in a tank at a time because if you have two males, They'll kill each other, um, or at least one of them will kill the other and then not look pretty anymore. The lionfish is another great example of a bony fish. They are brightly colored because of cells called chromatophores, um, and their colors are a warning of enlarged pectoral fins that are tipped with deadly poison glands. So yeah, keep your distance from a lionfish. Spiny puffer. That's another fish that a lot of us are familiar with. They eat hard corals or mollusks with a small beak-like mouth. They are able to inflate themselves with water to puff up many times their normal size. When they do this, their spines stick out and they kind of look like a porcupine. And um, they have a deadly toxin um, in their body which must be very carefully removed if you're going to eat one. Honestly, I'd say it's just not worth the risk. They're dangerous on the outside, dangerous on the inside. Come on, have a pizza. And uh, the last fish that we're going to talk about is the butterfly fish. They, um, this is actually a group of fish. It's a general name for just all the brightly colored tropical marine fish. Uh, so it's kind of like birds of paradise. It's not like a particular bird. It's a whole, it's a whole bunch of them. Um, chromatophores in their posterior produce a very dark pigment in a disc shape, which almost looks like an eye. If it looks like you have an eye on your posterior side, then it's going to prevent predators from following you because it looks like you're watching them. It wards off other fish and it distracts predators from their real head, which, you know, if were to be injured, they could get killed. Anyway, that is fish. We talked about the jawless fish. We talked about cartilage fish. And then we talked about bony fish. Um, turns out that um, fish is not a uh, what's called a cladistic classification because we are descended from fish. And one of the rules of evolution is you can never stop being what your ancestors were, which means technically speaking, we are fish. But only in the sense that we share all the characteristics with fish that we saw involving their body systems and we are descended from them. So no, we are not ectothermic, scaly, aquatic creatures, but we are uh, vertebrates um, with a chambered heart and a through digestive tract and all that detail. Anyway, as we go through amphibians and reptiles and mammals, the similarities uh, are gonna become more clear. Anyway, that's fish and I will see you next time.